Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Azim Sharif. He is an Assistant Professor of Psychology at the U of O and Director of the Culture and Morality Lab. Sharif's interests include religion and pro-social behavior, the causes and consequences of free will beliefs, network science, the psychology of environmentalism, and the psychological impact of economic trends. Sharif, along with philosophy professor Mark Alfano, directs the Scientific Study of Values Research Interest Group, which is sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Your bio states that you trained at the intersection of evolutionary and cultural psychology. Tell us a little bit about the questions that those two disciplines or subfields explore. That's a good question. So I trained at the University of British Columbia, which has a unique psychology department in that it's expert on both evolutionary psychology and cultural psychology. These are usually pitted against each other. Evolutionary psychology tries to look at the uh, biological origins of psychological phenomenon, things that we evolved genetically to have as innate modes of thinking. Cultural psychology, on the other hand, looks at differences between culture cultural explanations for other types of psychological phenomenon. So whereas evolutionary psychology tends to assume that things are universal because these are things which all humans have evolved to have, cultural psychology looks at the differences. However, by putting them together um, and using uh, a different uh, uh, perspective on it, which is called cultural evolution, which uses Darwinian selectionist thinking to explain how cultures developed rather than just how humans developed, mm you have this, this particular connection, which has great explanatory power for explaining not just humans as organisms, but human societies. So I know that your, much of your work investigates the psychology of religion. Obviously, this is relevant to the point you just made. Tell us first, what led to your interest in the psychology of religion? When I started graduate school, I was very interested in evolutionary psychology, and I was very interested in the origins of morality, moral thinking and moral behavior. I wasn't at that point interested in religion. I myself was raised Muslim, but I kind of strayed away from the faith in my teenage years. When I started at UBC, my graduate advisor, he was very interested in religion. He'd done some work on it prior. He, he gave me a big, thick uh, synthesis paper that he'd written and said, you're working with me now. You have to do something on religion. Find something in here that you're interested in. And there was a small bit that he'd written about how religion might relate to the origins of moral behavior, and I said, can we study that? And he says, well, we can try, but it's, it's a very difficult topic. And so that's where I kind of started. We, we married our interests in, in between the origins of moral behavior and religion and kind of put together this exciting research project. So tell me what moral psychology is. So it's, it's what it sounds like, right? So it's, it's trying to understand the, the psychology, the modes of thinking, the attitudes, and the behavioral consequences of things which relate to morality. Typically, this started uh, in moral development, so understanding how uh, children develop moral thinking. It used to be very much focused on moral cognition, that is, how do people reason about moral, uh, moral problems, right? So you give people scenarios, uh, this man has to break into a pharmacy to save his wife uh, because he has to steal medicine for her. What is the appropriate thing to do? And people <coughs> are supposed to reason through these things. Uh, about 15 years ago, there was a massive kind of shift in what moral psychology was about, which looked more at uh, emotional uh, motivations for moral behavior. It, it, it was part of a general shift in psychology away from the emphasis on conscious reasoning and more towards implicit emotional thinking. And it turns out that that motivates our moral, beha moral behavior and moral decision making a lot more than the cognition does. One of the many areas of research you focus on is uh, on the importance of the belief of heaven and hell, and or hell, on social behavior. So this seems to be one of these cases where um, cultural psychology is really critical for you. Obviously, different cultures have different conceptions. So tell us a little bit about your findings about this, um, cultures that uh, have different beliefs in heaven and hell. What do you find? Sure. So that that spun out of uh, research trying to understand what about psychology, or sorry, what about religion actually contributes to moral behavior. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of theories as to why religion would be associated with moral behavior. One of the ones that we've been uh, examining with my, with my collaborators is this idea that there's a punishing aspect of uh, belief in God, that if you believe in a punishing God who is 
uh, watching you and able to judge you for moral transgressions and then punish you for that, then this is going to actually keep people in check. It's going to serve as a, as a supernatural deterrent to uh, immoral behavior. Um, one of the predictions that makes is that a belief in a moral judgmental afterlife and one which leads people to fear the eternal punishment, so basically the in most enormous punishment you could possibly imagine, that would be an effective deterrent. Uh, and so that motivated us to look across uh, different uh, societies, uh, different countries uh, in the world now to see how the belief in hell related to uh, crime rates in this case. We'd done some previous experiments looking just in the lab at students, looking at people who believed in uh, forgiving gods, loving, compassionate gods versus people who believed in angry, vengeful, punishing gods. And we found that those who believed in the latter kind, the punishing gods, the malevolent gods, they would cheat less. Uh, we, ha we had them uh, do a math task. Uh, it made it very tempting for them to cheat. Those people who had that more malevolent view of God would cheat less, whereas those people who had the more benevolent view, they would actually cheat more. And so that prompted us to want to look outside the lab. That was a very artificial lab measure. We gave them this really tempting math task. Is it the case that if you look at something very s socially relevant, like crime, you would see similar effects? And so we looked at 60-something uh, countries. Across them, people who believed in hell, uh, places where there was a higher proportion of people believed in hell, had lower crime rates when you control for the belief in heaven. So what that means is that if you look at the difference score between the proportion of people in a country who believe in heaven and the proportion who believe in hell, that is, there are some places where uh, ev almost everybody believes in heaven and almost everybody believes in hell. So a place like Tanzania is a good case of that. There's not very many people who believe in heaven but don't believe in hell. Other places like, say, Brazil, you have a big discrepancy. So 40% more people will believe in, in heaven than the people who believe in hell. So you have a lot of people with this heaven belief that's not checked by the malevolent side of religion. And we find that in those countries where there's that greater difference, where there's a, a relatively lower belief in hell, there's more crime rates. And that's for homicide, uh, violent crime, uh, assault, robbery across the board, which is what we'd predict if it was the supernatural punishment angle which was keeping people uh, morally in line. What about people who do not subscribe to religion? How do they measure up in this calculus? So that's a very interesting question because there's this great assumption that pervades a lot of the assumptions and prejudices against non-believers that they are immoral. Uh, a majority of tested countries, majorities in, those, in most countries say that the belief in God is necessary to be moral. Uh, and for people who are believers who see that religion is the source of their morality, that would make sense. Without that source, how could you, how could you possibly be moral? Moreover, if you don't have this watcher, uh, you don't have somebody who's keeping you in check, or at least you don't believe that there's somebody keeping you in check, what is stopping you? What is stopping you from being immoral? Um, what we find when we look at the evidence is that by and large, there is, if anything, only a very small difference between believers and non-believers in terms of things like charity, volunteering, uh, m and certainly there's no difference in any measures of, of antisocial behavior. One of the reasons why there might be more of volunteering and charity is simply because religious people are tapped into a community in which those things are encouraged more. Uh, non-believers tend not to have as, as rich a community, and as a result, they suffer for that and, and don't have those opportunities. But people think that there's a massive difference. So anti-atheist prejudice is almost entirely driven by this, this profound sense of moral distrust. And we've done a bunch of research on that. So for example, if you ask somebody, um, I, should say, I should say that the, the, the rate of anti-atheist prejudice in America is, is compared to other groups, it's extremely high. Um, only in 2012 did you see that uh, a, a majority of people would possibly consider voting for an atheist president if they were a member of their own party. So they've, Gallup has kept a track of these polls for, for, for Catholics and women, African Americans, uh, uh, all those groups, it's well over 90% say that if there was a qualified member of their party, they would vote for him if they belonged to those groups. Um, homosexuals uh, have come up in that respect very quickly, actually recently as well. Atheists are the bottom group. They are the ones that people are least comfortable with voting for. They're also the ones that people are least comfortable with having their kids marrying 
They would be much more uncomfortable having their kids marrying uh, an atheist than, say, other uh, stigmatized groups like Muslim Americans or African Americans. Um, and so what we do is we ask them, how comfortable would you be having an atheist in one of these professions? And we ask them for a, a profession which doesn't require uh, any trust. So being a waiter, all you have to do is trust that they're not gonna spin your food, otherwise everything's okay, or poison it. Um, in that situation, people don't have a problem with atheists. They don't have a problem with them uh, serving their food. If you ask them a, a situation in which there is a lot of trust required, say being a babysitter or a kindergarten teacher, uh, somewhere where you're entrusting your kids with them, there you see very, very few people are comfortable with having an atheist in that position. So it seems like trust is the, is the big motivator there, even though it's, it's unwarranted, that, that moral distrust is generally unwarranted given what we see in the behavioral data on their moral behavior. Another one of the areas that you study is uh, free will. And there are studies I've learned um, that call into question this ideal of free will. Give us a sense of the evidence for that view, that, that free, free will, will doesn't exist. Yeah. So I don't have a set position on whether in the grand scheme of things free will exists or not. Mm -hmm. What I do know is given what we understand about psychology and neuroscience now, it certainly doesn't exist in the way that we intuit it to. We think of our free will in a way that is somewhat metaphysical. Uh, we think of it in, in, in this old fashioned kind of dualist sort of way that there is our bodies and our minds and our minds are somehow removed from the natural order of things that they can spontaneously metaphysically develop an, uh, an urge that we have something we wanna do. And all of a sudden that has an uncaused cause on the rest of the causal chain in the natural world. So we have this, this kind of metaphysical miracle that happens in our brain that motivates our body to do, uh, to, to then affect the natural world in the same way that everything else affects the natural world. Uh, it's almost certain that that view is wrong. In fact, it is, it is certain that that view is wrong. We are uh, uh, natural creatures. We are organisms like anything, any other organism in the world, and we have to follow the rules of nature. Um, and that means that, well, there has to be biological causes for those urges. There can't be miracles that happen in our brain, they can't be metaphysical. They have to be the consequence of other uh, physical causes. And so what, when we really digest what uh, a materialistic, not a consumerist, but a materialistic, a naturalistic uh, perspective on life entails, that is one without any metaphysical commitments, uh, free will can't exist in that, in that intuitive dualistic sort of way. But what I was really interested in is how those beliefs affect behavior. I got, as, I got interested in the question of conscious, consciousness and free will as an undergrad, and I very quickly figured out that I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not a neuroscience, I'm not going to be the one to solve that particular problem, but as a social psychologist, I can figure out the consequences of the belief, the social consequences of the belief. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, a couple of my mentors in, in graduate school, they'd done some work showing that when people's belief in free will is diminished, that is when you tell people everything that I just told you about, about all the scientific reasons as to why, why we might doubt free will, and then you go a little further, you go be beyond the evidence and really try to convince them, what happens is they then end up cheating more, and they end up stealing more, and they end up lying more, and they end up being more aggressive. And the reason why, one would suspect, is that if you are not metaphysically responsible for your behavior, if you're not ultimately uh, responsible in some sort of dualistic sense, then why bother acting moral? Why bother uh, uh, engaging in the effort and the sacrifices that it requires to be moral? You might as well say, I'm just an automaton. Mm -hmm. Who cares? It's not my fault. Um, but there is another side to that, which is that there are things which uh, this emphasis on extreme moral responsibility uh, can actually have a negative effect. And one of those is in the, in the area of punishment. Um, so in the United States, we have a justice system which is very much built on this idea of what's called uh, retributivist punishment rather than consequentialist punishment. So we punish people not because we're trying to make society better, not because we're trying to uh, rehabilitate them or because we want to uh, deter other criminals. Um, the goals of the punish, punishing system, the, the, the justice system, are to extract uh, suffering from those who have 
uh, committed a crime against uh, society. <coughs> if it's the case that we are not metaphysically responsible for our actions, if it's the case that we're, we are not ex uh, uh, responsible in this ultimate uh, dualistic sense, then it's possible that this retributivist uh, mode of punishment is not justified that really what we should be trying to do is work at a mechanistic level to figure out what it is that we can change behavior or we can change uh, the behavior of future criminals and, and reduce uh, crime in our society, thereby making it better. And so we set out to, to test whether there is this relationship between free will belief and uh, punitive attitudes. And you found? And we found, uh, as we predicted, that people who uh, have their belief in free will diminished but also people who just learn about neuroscience, mm. they tend to become less retributivist. Mm -hmm. uh, so their punishment then, the balance of their punishment is mainly driven by consequentialist motives, by motives for rehabilitation or deterrence or uh, what's called incapacitation, removing the uh, potentially dangerous people from situations in which they could be dangerous. One of the studies we did is, is in a class here at, at U of O. Uh, there's uh, one of our intro classes is, is Psych 201 mind and brain. Uh, these are undergraduates, a lot of freshmen, they're coming in, they're learning about the brain, they're learning about the, the natural mechanisms of our thought and action for the first time. And that is a pretty profound thing to learn, right? To recognize that we have this, this natural organ in our brain that is responsible for everything we do and think. Uh, and so that, to some degree, it creates this shift in, in, in worldview. You start realizing that we are natural creatures and that our, our actions have natural causes. And so what we found is that across the term, from when people started taking this class to when they finished taking this class and had learned about the brain, they became less punitive. So it changed their view on moral issues, moral issues which are societally quite important. And we found that those students who reported learning most about the brain are the people who saw the steepest drop in mm -hmm. their retributivist attitudes. And I think that's encouraging for a number of reasons. First, it means that we're actually teaching them something, <laughs> that, that they're actually learning about the brain, which is nice. Second, it means that they're actually applying what they're learning about the brain to these important issues, which is, I think, even nicer. Uh, t in 2012, you co-wrote an article about climate change and moral judgment, in which you and your collaborators contend that humans aren't equipped to identify climate change as a moral imperative. Why, and what are the implications of that? So this was a paper that was uh, spearheaded by a student of mine, Ezra Markowitz, um, who's now on the faculty at, at University of Massachusetts. And he was very motivated by these uh, environmental issues. And uh, he and some of the other faculty that were here when I came here uh, underscored how this is basically the most important question we're facing. And again, I'm not going to be the engineer who's going to solve it, but what do I know about social psychology that can contribute to it? And what I know is, is that, that we have uh, a number of biases in our moral psychology, which make it difficult for us to, to, to have the moral alarm bells ring in our head about this climate change issue. Mm -hmm. I was just actually looking at the stats on this, and uh, they had seven different threats. Uh, there was, a, I think it was a Pew poll, seven different threats uh, that are facing America, which are the most serious. Um, you can imagine what are the top ones, right? E Ebola and ISIS. At the bottom, I think second from the bottom, just under the threat of China, is global climate change. Mm. So people are not really feeling the, 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 the uh, visceral reaction to this threat in the same way that they are to uh, an infectious disease, which has killed, what, one person in the United States, or ISIS, which has killed, I guess now, one person in Canada, yeah. maybe. Um, I, uh, and so it's, it's not happening. Why is it not happening? Well, there's a number of reasons. One of, I think, the most interesting is that the victims, the perceived victims of climate change, are not people that you interact with every day. They're not people that you see. They are going to be either people in Vanuatu, people far away that you've never met, that maybe you've seen on TV, but probably not. And they're going to be people in the future. So mm -hmm. they're removed from us in space, and they're removed from us in time. And it's harder to care about those people. Uh, I think Hume had this quote, and I'm paraphrasing here, that I would rather a million Chinese die than to lose my little finger. And he's, he's not saying that as if it's a good thing. He's saying that he recognizes that based on his psychology, he cares more about himself to that degree than he does to a million people he's never met. Mm 
and and that's part of what what makes it difficult for us to care about the victims of, of climate change a lot. So, uh, given that, and I want to motivate people to care about climate change, what do I do? So, one thing is this this idea called the contact hypothesis. So, the more people come into contact, this is not surprising. This is mm -hmm. this is classic social psychology. Mm -hmm. The more people come into contact with people, the more they end up caring about them, and uh, the less removed from them they feel because they are less removed from them. Mm -hmm. So, appeals which humanize. Uh, the people who are far away from us, and in some sense connect us to the future. Mm -hmm. Those are things which, which will make us care about climate change more. So if you have people think about their grandchildren, if you have people imagine what the world is going to be like when their grandchildren are alive, they're going to care more about the plight of what happens to their grandchildren than they are if they're just than if they're just focused on themselves, which we are for or our immediate children for most of our day. You run the Culture and Morality Lab at U of O. What does the Culture and Morality Lab do? Well, it studies culture and it studies morality. <laughs> <laughs> Along the lines of everything you've just been Yeah, well, about. exactly, right? So I think that, um, as, as I mentioned before, when we, when we first started talking about moral psychology, it, it used to be that we understood morality as, uh, as a, a consequence of sort of moral literacy, that the more, we the more sophisticated we can reason about morality, we'll just get better at it. Um, so the people who are best able to, to sophisticatedly reason about it are going to be the mor most moral people. What this shift has led to is that it, things like emotion, things like culture, things that social psychology has been talking about for a long time, influence, influence us in our moral behavior to a, a remarkable extent. And we've seen examples of that when I've talked about this research. So uh, a moral innovation like heaven or hell or, or a malevolent God, those things are going to affect our moral behavior a lot. Um, our belief in free will, this folk belief that is either uh, uh, raised by metaphysical thinking or, or pushed down by naturalistic thinking, that's a, another cultural idea which has an effect on moral behavior. Similarly, there's aspects of, of culture which can either raise or lower our, our concern about climate change, our moral concern about climate change. And so all of those are situations in which culture plays this important part in affecting our moral behavior. I think that's pretty interesting, and I think that's pretty important. How many people work in the lab? I have five graduate students um, who are my own. Uh, we have a number of graduate students from other labs who are affiliated with the lab. They do projects with us. They come to our lab meetings. Um, and then we have about 10 or, 10, 10 or 12 uh, undergraduate research assistants and honors students. And these are people who either volunteer to help out with the graduate student projects or they do honors projects with me, which is some uh, requirement um, for some programs in which they're they're doing a, a basically a directed studies project. These are undergraduates. These are undergraduates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You, I mean, you're you're a scientist. Scientific research is collaborative by definition, but it's also the case that you are a collaborator um, across different kinds of boundaries. I mean, it's already clear in the way you talk about the work that you do bridging. Uh, divides within the field of psychology, but I also know that you collaborate with philosophers. You you're you are a collaborator across disciplinary lines. Why is that important to you? If you take uh, an issue like religion, um, and you take the important questions: uh, Is religion connected to moral behavior? Does religion encourage pro-social behavior? What is the origin of religion? How did a religion develop in a way where it looks the way it does now? Those are questions which I think uh, many of them can be tackled by social psychology, but social psychology on its own is ill-equipped to answer them. Uh, we've borrowed in our experiments methodologies that have come from experimental economics and anthropology. We've been informed by uh, uh, research by archaeologists, uh, uh, by historians of religion, and by philosophers. All that thought has to be brought together to answer these particular big questions. Uh, like I said before, I have social psychological expertise. Those are, to some degree, narrow. I need to bring in other people to help answer those questions. The issue of free will, we would not have got anywhere had there not been these neuroscientists and these philosophers for a long time telling us that things are more complicated than you think. You are one of the founders and a, and a participant in the Scientific Study of Values Research Interest Group. It sounds from what you just said that that's one of the ways that you're creating uh, interdisciplinary exchange with uh, 
I mean, on this campus, we have experimental philosophers, we have uh, experimental economists. This seems to be a good place to do the kind of work you do. Is that right? Absolutely, right. So, so that was co-founded with with the philosopher Mark Alfano, and and when he came here, he was he, he was quite a, a stimulant for <laughs> consilience. Uh, there were a lot, there are a lot of uh, professors. Uh, and researchers uh, on this campus in these different fields that are all interested to some degree in this or from different angles in this question of human values. So we have, as you mentioned, economists, we have philosophers, uh, we have people in the environmental studies program, we have um, anthropologists, political scientists, all of these people. Uh, human values is of course a massive topic. It's something which is very interesting to people and rightly so. It's an incredibly norm important project and it's something that can only be tackled if we have all of these people contributing their thoughts together. And so the, the values group is an attempt to do so. It's an attempt to, to facilitate discussion, which wouldn't otherwise happen if we were head down in our own departments. So it's looking at narrowly at our own fields. Fantastic. We've got about a uh, minute and 30 seconds left. Um, is there anything that you're currently working on that you'd like to tell us about? New material, new, new projects, new questions? So, one of the things which has become increasingly interesting to me is the issue of anti-Muslim prejudice, uh, as well as anti-Christian prejudice. Both of these spun out of the work on anti-atheist prejudice that we've done. Uh, anti-Muslim prejudice is interesting uh, in light of the perennial uh, challenge of, of uh, religiously inspired terrorism, which tends to come disproportionately from uh, Muslim quarters. Anti-Christian prejudice is something we don't really think about very much because they tend to be the most dominant uh, majority group in, in the United States, and they do. They make up about 77% of the country. But in places like academia, and especially in places like science, they are underrepresented uh, mm -hmm. for their population and also actually not even the majority anymore. And so it could be that there's a situation, there's an area where they are actually experiencing prejudice against themselves, which could be discouraging them from going into science, which is, I think, a shame. So uh, with one of my graduate students, we're doing a bunch of research looking at uh, the degree to which stereotypes keep uh, Christians away from pursuing science and actually have them underperforming in science compared to their actual potential. Well, that is extremely interesting, as is all the work that you've described. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to tell us about your work and research. No problem. Thank you for having me, Paul. I've been speaking with Azim Sharif, an assistant professor of psychology at the U of O and director of the Culture and Morality Lab. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.